so good to have you back with us for our Wednesday evening Bible study time and prayer time. Glad that you've joined us and look forward to the service tonight. Especially look forward to the fact that hopefully this is the last service that we have to be apart. That we'll be back here in the building this coming Sunday morning. So I look forward to that and I'm sure you do too. We're going to begin our service with this chorus, Great and Mighty is the Lord our God and He is. And it's a good way to start the service. So just encourage you to join in with us there at home as you see the words there on your screen. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Sing it two times through. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Lift up your banner, let the anthem ring. Praises to our King. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Lift up your banner, let the anthems ring. Praises to our King. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. That's a good way to start our service off tonight. And uh, again, just very, very glad you're here to be with us. And right before we pray, let's just go over some special announcements and hopefully you have a, a piece of paper and a pen. You can take down some of these uh, special prayer requests tonight. Uh, begin, though, with praise. First, the fact that all those who have been in the hospital are now home. Uh, Luella Burton came home yesterday. Dave Burton uh, has also gone home as well as Rick Matheny. And then, of course, many of you know that Leslie Hickman's mom, Brenda Smith, was also in the hospital, and she is now home. So we're very grateful to the Lord for this. I found out yesterday that there are a few other folks that I was not aware who have also been dealing with the virus, and that makes 30 folks from our, our fellowship that have battled the coronavirus. But I'm glad to report tonight that all of them have either been healed or are on that verge of just being delivered from it. So we're very, very grateful to the Lord for his mercy to our folks. And uh, just thank you for being diligent to pray daily for our church family uh, during this time. There are some other requests that I'd like to bring to your attention as we continue to pray for those who are still recovering. I mentioned on our one call yesterday uh, a newborn by the name of Britt Asaro and found out that this little infant uh, did because of the hard delivery had a stroke and has brain damage on the right side of the baby's brain. So if you would pray that God would do what he needs to do uh, for the Asaro family. Uh, you can imagine how devastated these folks are. We pray God to do something special in this little infant's life, Britt Asaro. And then we want to remember Mike Nice Warner. Mike will have his knee scoped on Friday and just be in prayer for Mike that, that all would go well with that surgery. And then also uh, Butch Horschler. Uh, this is a relative of Nick George. And Nick uh, mentioned the other day, sent me a text that uh, the lung surgery that he was supposed to have last week, it had been postponed, uh, happened this past Monday, and it was very successful. It has already improved uh, Mr. Horschler's breathing much. Of course, we've been praying for this family uh, spiritually as well, that God would just bring him to a saving knowledge of himself. So if you would, continue to remember Butch, that God would bring healing to him. He, he battles cancer, and so this the surgery on his lungs they actually, I guess, what they called it, what I was expressed to me, was shaved his lungs and uh, was successful. So pray for him, not only with his breathing, but God would just touch him with the cancer as well. 
So those are some additional prayer requests that if you have a, a prayer list from our Wednesday night or regular Wednesday night services, you can add or update on your list. And uh, just keep these folks in prayer. Let's go ahead and we'll bow together for prayer. And we'll ask God to do a special work in these lives. Father, I thank you for the kindness you've shown to us. Lord, we hear all the heartbreaking stories of the 200,000 plus uh, citizens of this country who have lost their lives to this COVID disease. And we just thank you, Lord, that for those here who have had it, you have spared them from death. I thank you for that. I really do. I thank you, Lord, that there has been a great improvement in our folks. And I I praise you for those who have been sent home from the hospital. And there's still a need, Lord, for your touch for those folks. I think about Brother Rick. I think about Brother Dave and Miss Olella. I think about Leslie's mom, Brenda. Lord, we just ask that you continue to strengthen their bodies. And, Lord, there are others, some who are what I guess would be said completely over it, but others who are still in that healing process. But I thank you for the very good reports on folks and to just ask that you continue to add healing. And Lord, we think about the Asaro family tonight um, and somewhat relate to what this, this couple is going through, the devastating news for their, their infant. But Lord, we realize that you make no mistakes that as someone has said, you're good all the time, and all the time you're good. I, I don't know the Asaro's relationship with you, but I pray you'd use it for good in their life to cause them to turn to you or to just continue to lean on you. And yet there's a great need of comforting, and that's who your Holy Spirit is. He is the comforter. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would do that work for this family and just point them to the Father, that they would look to him. I ask that you would minister to this child. Uh, It's nothing to you to touch someone and raise them up. And you could very easily do this to this little infant. So, Lord, whatever your perfect will is for this child, I ask that you would intervene in his behalf. Lord, I ask also for uh, Mike Nice Warner, as Brother Mike has the knee surgery on Friday, that he would be successful, that you would bring him through safely. And again, a surgery is surgery. There's always some risk with any surgery, no matter how major or minor it may seem. And it's only minor if it's not you that's having it. So, Father, I just ask that you would bring him safely through, give those, those surgeons and those working in that surgery wisdom to make right decisions and uh, protect Mike from infections or just any other issues that might occur during that surgery and lift him up. Thank you for what you did for Mr. Horschler. Thank you, Lord, that his breathing has greatly improved and just ask, Lord, again, that you would touch him with that cancer, that you would uh, lift him up that way and just work in that family spiritually. Uh, Continue to use Nick and Victoria to minister well to them just continually pointing them toward you. Think this evening about many of our missionaries, and uh, I think about the family that was here with us uh, in just recent months, the Reeves family, who's now back in the Czech Republic. The the email I received from them today that the country is once again closed down. They're not allowed to meet for church. Lord, this is a theme all over this globe missionaries unable to be with their people, uh, not allowed to meet together, uh, whether it's in South America or whether it's in uh, India or whether it's in uh, Eastern Europe or wherever it may be. This this is a continual theme. And Lord, I think it's a devastating thing not to be able to have fellowship with your people. So I ask that you would just give these missionaries wisdom to know how to minister to their people. We know you've given us the advantage of doing what we're doing right now, the modern technology of a live stream service, Zoom, all those things that you have provided, but it's not the same as being together. So we would ask that you lift the curse of this pandemic. Lord, 
even for the sake of your people, the sake, Lord, of being able to assemble together. And may it give us a brand new appreciation of being able to be together. I ask that you would do that if it be your will. Don't question, Father, that this is a unique time and we may very well be approaching that time you call the day of the Lord. There are multiple reasons for thinking that is true. But no matter what, you tell us to occupy till we come. Lord, help us to be busy about telling others about your son. Help us to be busy about walking with you and growing our fellowship with you. Help us, Lord, to encourage one another. While we may not be able to always be together, as has been the case these last few weeks, we can still reach out to one another, whether it's a text, whether it's a phone call, whether it's a letter. We can still minister to one another. I pray, Lord, you just help us. Help us to do so. And Lord, I ask as we look into your word this evening that you would teach us. I hope that folks are getting a benefit out of this study on the apostles as much as I have been being blessed in my own personal study for it. And I ask that would be true tonight. So, Lord, have your way in the rest of the service. Lord, just bless your people. And, Lord, work in Grace Baptist Church for good. And we do look forward to this Sunday being able to be back once again. And we thank you again for the mercy you've shown to us. We ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Right before we take our Bibles, and we'll be going again into the New Testament to the book of Luke, uh, I want you to go ahead and just sing with me one more chorus. We have come into this house and gathered in his name to worship him. We'll sing this chorus together. we study together, it is a form of worship. I'm personally convinced, I've said it a bunch of times over the years, that I believe everything we do is an aspect of worship, whether at the workplace, whether we're in an activity, a hobby, we magnify his name in some way, whether it's for good or even for bad, we, we do that, and so I trust that as we look into God's word tonight, we would understand that Again, it is a form of worship, and I trust that you can just direct your attention tonight to God's Word, and so many distractions, it's bad enough, you know, when you're in an auditorium, there are things that distract us, and I can't imagine, well, yes, I can, because I've, I've watched services online and know how distracting sometimes being in a, in a house can be, so I hope that you can concentrate tonight. Again, as we have done the last few times, as we have been looking through the lives of the apostles, we're going to go to the book of Luke, chapter 6, and we're going to read verses 12 through 16 by way of introduction tonight. Luke, chapter 6, beginning in verse 12. 
And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom also he named apostles, Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas the brother of James, and Judas Iscariot, which was also the traitor. You notice that he pairs them. It's Peter and Andrew, James and John, and so forth. These 12 men were paired into groups of two. They would be sent out later to evangelize, and they would go two by two. So it's significant that as we look at this particular man tonight, uh, who he was paired with. And we're looking tonight at the life of the Apostle Thomas. Thomas is listed eighth in the list of the apostles. And I think there is significance to that. He's listed eighth here in the book of Luke, and he's also listed eighth in the book of Mark. And notice who he's paired with. He's paired with Matthew. Now, of course, we've been going through the book of Matthew on Sundays, and uh, our theme being Follow Me. And you notice he is paired with Matthew. It's interesting because in the book of Matthew, Matthew basically follows that same pattern, but when it comes to himself and Thomas, instead of listing Thomas, Thomas in that eighth slot, he elevates Thomas above himself. And I, there's, I guess, really nothing special about that other than I just find that kind of a, an act of humility in the personality and the heart of Thomas that while the Holy Spirit directed Mark and directed Luke to place Matthew above Thomas in that rank, Matthew himself would place Thomas above him. So I think that's, I think that's significant. Now, I want to show you something here tonight, and you'll see it there on your computer or on your screen tonight. I want you to notice, since we're speaking about Thomas, I want you to see Thomas's burial place. And this is found in Chennai, India. It once was called, when the British ruled India, it was called Madras, India. It's on the eastern side of India. And this is believed to be the burial place of Thomas. Now, that cathedral was certainly not there when, when Thomas was buried, but around his tomb has been built this basilica or this uh, chapel uh, there in that city. The reason I point that out to you is it is believed in good evidence that Thomas went to India and ministered there and was martyred there. It is said that he was shot through with many arrows and died that death, the martyr's death there in India, and his body lies there in India, in Chennai, India. So as you see that, I want you to think about this man first, thinking about how his life ended. His life ended dedicated to the Lord Jesus Christ. His life ended giving his life for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I will say this in retrospect. We can say about Thomas, he was a great man of God. A great man of God. And I think we can say that about the 11 apostles of course, we cannot say that about Judas Iscariot. He was the traitor. But we can say that about all these others. These were great men, men who loved the Lord Jesus Christ. And as the Bible says, they hazarded their lives for the Lord Jesus, and they were willing to lay down their lives. And the majority of them, maybe with the exception of the Apostle John, were martyred. Now, of this particular apostle, Thomas, unlike the men we've already looked at, and we've looked at James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon Zelotes. There are actually things written about Thomas. With those other men, there were really very little, if anything, written about them other than them being listed among the apostles. Now, just to have your name listed among the apostles and know one day when we get to heaven and we look at that city, the foundations are going to bear the names of men like Thaddeus and men like uh, Simon Zelotes and so forth. So it is a tremendous privilege to have 
walked with Jesus Christ. But of those men, there is really nothing mentioned of them other than their names. But that's not the case with Thomas. There are three conversations involving the Apostle Thomas. And each of those conversations is found in the last gospel, the Gospel of John. And while he is listed as Thomas in each of the official listings of the apostles, in Matthew chapter 10, Mark 3, and Luke 6, and then later in Acts chapter 1, we find he was also at times called Didymus. And John, every time he referred to Thomas, or at least most of the times, said Thomas, who is called Didymus. Now, what do these names mean? Well, the word Thomas and the word Didymus uh, both mean the same thing. They mean twin. So it's believed that he had a twin. There are some men who think it was given in reference to what appears to be almost a dual personality. And I don't, I don't mean that in the, in the psychological way, but here's a man who walked by faith and is known by another title, which we'll look at in just a moment. But I, more than likely, it just refers to the fact that he had a twin brother. Who that twin brother was, really don't know who that was. So Thomas, that Hebrew name, twin, and Didymus, the Greek name, meaning twin. Now I mention that just because this is a study and we're looking at his life, trying to be uh, careful to get as much as we can out of this, but I also mention it because over the course of church history, he's also developed another name, and I think you know what that name is. It's not so much a name as it is a title, and personally, I think it's a bad rap. And I hope that tonight, as we look at his life, we'll come to understand why I personally believe it's, it's an unfair uh, title for him. As you know, I think you're already thinking of it. He's referred to many times as Doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas. Now we're going to look at those passages in the book of John, and we're going to begin in John chapter 11. John chapter 11. Now the interesting thing about the Gospel of John, it is distinctly different from uh, the other Gospels in that we find detailed conversation of the Lord Jesus. And when we come to chapter 11, he is going to go to Bethany just literally days away from entering Jerusalem, being declared king by the masses, and then a few days later having Many of those same people cry out, crucify him, and then he dies on Calvary. To the end of the book, where after his resurrection, he meets with the apostles and challenges them to go into all the world, where he said famously, so send I you. He meets those men there on the seashore, fix them breakfast, and challenges Peter. Peter, lovest thou me more than these? And so... It's really just a matter of days or just a few weeks from chapter 11 to the end of the Gospel of John. And in those last days, there are three conversations that Jesus and the apostles and Thomas have. Now, these aren't long conversations. There's not a lot of, of words attributed to Thomas but every one has great significance, and I want you to notice this tonight. In John chapter 11, now we, we all know the account here of Jesus raising his friend Lazarus from the dead. Now to me personally, now this is for me personally, is the greatest of all the miracles that Jesus performed. Now, that may not be your mindset. Uh, I can't argue with anyone who would say, oh, to me the greatest miracle is Jesus walking on the water or saying to the storm, peace be still, and all of a sudden, the storm stops. I can understand that. I can understand someone say, to me, the greatest miracle is when Jesus you know, took those five loaves and two fishes and with those fed thousands and thousands of people. I could understand that. In fact, you could probably plug in just about any miracle J did and consider that personally the greatest miracle that the Lord performed during his three and a half year ministry. For me, I look at this, and the reason being is Jesus was well aware that Lazarus had died, and Jesus purposely delayed his coming so that 
by the time he arrives in Bethany, which was very close to Jerusalem, Lazarus had been dead four days. Now, while the Egyptians practiced the, uh, the practice of embalming, the Jews did not do so. And so, having been now in the tomb for four days, we know what was going on, decomposition. And so when Martha says to Jesus, Behold, Lord, he stinketh. My brother has been in that tomb for four days, and his body stinks. She meant exactly what she said. His body was rotting. And after those four days, for Jesus to raise this man from the dead, there could be no question, and there really wasn't a question now, among the Pharisees, the scribes, the lawyers, the Sadducees, and the people. There was no question of this man's greatness and his power. To me, personally, the greatest miracle he ever did. And in the midst of this account in John chapter 11 is a statement by Thomas, and that statement is this, let us also go that we may die with him. Now, I want to go back, and just for clarity's sake, let's read from verse 1 up to that statement. Verse 1 of John 11. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and his sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister, and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that he saith to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. Now I want you to notice carefully verse 8. His disciples saying to him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day, if any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking rest in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, to the intent ye may believe, nevertheless let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Let us also go, that we may die with him. Now someone said about Thomas, I read this the other day, he said that Thomas spake this in sarcastic terms. He was showing his doubt and his unbelief. In other words, when he heard the disciples say to Jesus, wait a minute, why would you go back into Judea? Why would you do this when you know that there is a plot against you. They are going to try to assassinate you. They're going to try to murder you. Why would you take this risk of going back and being stoned? Why would you do that? The thought was from this particular individual that, that Thomas, being the doubter he was, being negative as he was in this person's assessment, that he said in sarcastic terms, well, yeah, let's, let's just go back and die with Jesus. Now, I'm going to be honest with you and tell you, I think that is not right. I don't think that is the attitude of Thomas at all. I want you to notice that statement once again there in verse 16. And notice just the first half of Thomas's statement. He said, let us also go. For me personally, when I look at this, I think Thomas is showing a love and a devotion 
that none of the other disciples at this moment, I'm not talking about every moment of every day, but at this particular moment, I think Thomas was showing a love and a devotion at that moment. And it was revealed by the fact of what the other apostles said and then what Thomas would, would say after those few moments. In verse 8, it doesn't sound like the other apostles wanted Jesus to go to Bethany, nor were they really willing to go into harm's way themselves. They said there in verse 8, wait a minute, Lord, the, the Jews, they're trying to stone you. And, and, and wh why would you go there now? There's a death plot against you. you know, we don't want you to die, and, and quite frankly, we don't want to go into those, those uh, circumstances. We don't want to go into harm's way. But you notice what Thomas said. He said, let us also go. Let's go with Jesus. There's an interesting aspect to the high priestly prayer of Jesus. It's found in chapter 17 of this book. In verse 24, Jesus prayed, Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. Not where I will be not be with me one day in heaven, but be with me where I am, present tense, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. You know what? Every aspect of Jesus' life brought him glory. When he raised Lazarus from the dead, that certainly brought him glory. Oh, listen, the people were mesmerized by what had happened. Those who had been eyewitnesses went back that short journey to, to Jerusalem and spread the news abroad of this great miracle. No one could deny it. It brought him glory. When he walked on the water, that brought him glory. When he fed the thousands, it certainly brought him glory. When he preached the Sermon on the Mount, that brought him glory. But there were many things that brought Jesus glory. When the Pharisees came against him, it brought him glory. When he went into the judgment hall before Pilate, it brought glory. When he hung on the cross, it brought about glory to the Father. And Jesus says in his high priestly prayer, I want these men that you have given me, these 11 apostles. Of course, Judas has now gone out to betray Jesus. And as Jesus prays, he said, I want these men that you have given me to be with me where I am. In what we would consider good places and what we would consider bad places and what the 11 apostles considered good places and good times and what they would consider bad places and bad times, Jesus said, I want them to be where I am for this purpose, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. I mean, let me tell you something, no matter what our circumstances, it can bring God glory. It can bring the Lord Jesus Christ glory. And so if you are going through difficult circumstances, heartbreaking circumstances, can you keep this in mind that Jesus has been there too? And through any circumstance he found himself in, he always sought to bring the Father glory and did. And wherever you're at tonight in your life, whether things are going extremely well for you or extremely poor for you, your thought should be, Jesus has been there too. And he always sought to bring his Father glory. And in my circumstances, good or bad, I need to be recognizing the fact that I need to behold the Father's glory and bring him glory as well. And I really believe that that is part of Thomas's attitude. Let us also go. Jesus is willing to walk into harm's way, knowing what might befall him. And quite honestly, we know, did befall him. Death did come his way. And Thomas's words to the other apostles is, let us also go. Thomas was willing. Thomas was willing. The others seem hesitant. 
Thomas was not hesitant. And then notice the second part of that statement of Thomas is in verse 16, that we may die with him. Let's not just go, but if Jesus is going to die, let us die with him. Now, again, some might think that Thomas here was speaking about Lazarus, but I don't believe that's the case. I believe he's speaking about the Lord Jesus. If Jesus might have to die, then let me die with him. Now, can I say this? Isn't that what Jesus had been trying to teach the apostles all along? When you go back and you think about now the conclusion of these three and a half years of ministry, focusing on these apostles, wasn't that what he was trying to get across to those men? Think about Luke 14, verse 26. Jesus said this, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, now listen, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. How about Mark 8, 35? Whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. I personally think Thomas's attitude was, you know what, this is what Jesus has been teaching us all along. Now, as a group, we've just spoken in an attitude of fear. You want to go to Bethany and risk losing your life? And quite possibly Thomas remembered Jesus' teachings. You lose your life, you'll save it. For my sake and the gospel. And Thomas's words, hey, guys, let us go with him, that we may die also with him. It's apparent by this text in John 11 that all of the apostles despite their reservations, ended up accompanying Jesus to Bethany. And they might have had Thomas to thank for that. Because while they were hesitant to go, wait, wait a minute, Jesus, it just doesn't seem reasonable to go. It's Thomas who steps up and says, hey, let's go with him. That if necessary, we can die with him. That's what he's been teaching us. And so they went. And they were eyewitnesses of this miraculous event, the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead after four days rotting in the grave. Now think about this. Now listen, there's always courage in numbers. There's always courage in numbers. You say, what do you mean? All, all of those men, and at this point it's still Judas Iscariot along with him, all of them accompany Jesus. While they're initially hesitant and they warn Jesus not to go, and certainly, in the back of their mind, they're probably thinking, if there's risk to you, there's going to be a risk to us because we're your apostles. They ended up accompanying him, of Jesus, and I think they took comfort in the fact that, you know what, if, if Thomas is willing to go, we'll take courage too, and we'll go, and they accompanied Jesus in this tremendous event there at Bethany, the resurrection of Lazarus. I want you to go over to now to the second conversation found in John 14. And again, we're talking about just a matter of days. Jesus makes his way to Bethany. Lazarus is raised from the dead. And after this raising of the dead, he will eventually make his way into the city of Jerusalem, present himself to the people. They will say, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. They'll refer to him as the king. And of course, we know during that week, called the Passion Week, we know what happened. The mob is turned against him. They cry out, crucify him, and he is going to die. Now, from chapter 11 up until we hear the account of the crucifixion, chapter 19, Jesus is in an upper room. He's in the upper room because they're about to celebrate Passover. And they're going to have the Passover Seder together. The Bible here in chapter 13, verse 2, refers to it as the supper. In chapter 13, verse 2, it says, and supper being ended. So Jesus is now in this upper room, and after supper ends, he washes his disciples' feet, 
Judas Iscariot leaves to betray Jesus, and with those 11, he enters into this deep and wonderful conversation. And I want you to focus with me before we look at chapter 14. Go back in chapter 13 to verse 31. Because here Jesus begins to speak to them of the thing that they did not want to think about. In fact, Peter would rebuke Jesus. Be it far from thee, and he did not want Jesus to die, and he, he literally would try to keep his mind from absorbing those truths of what Jesus had said, that the Son of Man must go and be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and raised again the third day. He didn't want to think about that, nor did the others. And I think when it says that the, the disciples did not understand, I think they purposely did not want to understand, and they purposely drove it out of their thoughts. But now Jesus is just a matter of hours away from being betrayed. And he sets down with these men after the supper had ended, and he begins to speak to them, beginning now in chapter 13, verse 31. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway, straightway glorify him. Little children... Now notice what he calls the apostles, little children. Man, that's a, that's a term of endearment. That's a love term. Little children, yet a little while am I with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lie down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock, cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Now let me pause here for a minute. Notice as you go into chapter 14, the conversation is flowing. But notice the words of verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. When these 11 apostles heard those words, I'm departing and you cannot come with me. Sent heartache, discouragement, not only into the heart of Peter, but into all of those men. And Jesus speaking to his, his family, his little children, he said, let not your heart be troubled. Listen, folks, there are many times in our lives not only as Christians, but just as human beings living in a sin-cursed world that there is discouragement, there is fear, there is heartache. And here is the comforting, consoling words of our Savior. Let not your hearts be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. And then words that deal with the future. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Aren't you glad when Jesus prayed in John 17, I want them to be where I am. It's not just through the problems of this life, but brother, one day when life here is done, we get to be with him forever. That's, that's wonderful. Verse 4. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Now here is the second conversation of Thomas. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Notice those words. 
We know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Now, the words that Thomas just said are not necessarily words of doubt or confusion. In fact, when you really stop to think about it, it's the exact same question that Peter had posed. When you go back to chapter 13 and you look at verse 36, notice what Peter says. Lord, whither goest thou? Where are you going? And what does Thomas say? We know not where you're going. Where are you going? But will you notice what he adds to it? We know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Now that's encouraging to me. He wanted to know the way. Now, we understand this. Not only the Apostle Peter, and James, and John, and Andrew, and Matthew, but Thomas as well were already children of God. They were already his children. He states that. You are my little children. But he has this attitude, Jesus, wherever you go, I want to go. Jesus, let us go also and die with you. I'm willing to go with you and die with you, he stated back before they traveled to Bethany. But now he hears this word from Jesus, where I'm going, you cannot go, at least not now. And Thomas said, well, wait, wait, wait a minute. I, I, I want to know the way because I want to be with you. I want to be with you. Wherever you're going, that's where I want to be. I want you to think. Again, John eleven sixteen. 16. Let us go that we may die with him. Thomas, now listen, we know this. Thomas seemed to know the way to go to Bethany, even if it meant to death. And we know that to be true. Those, those men, Thomas and all the other apostles, many of them being Galileans, had traversed that path from there in, in Galilee down into Judea to Jerusalem many times. When Thomas said, hey, let us also go that we may die with him, he knew exactly how to get to Bethany. And it was no problem for them to go with Jesus. But this trip that Jesus spoke of, he said, you can't go with me to this place. At least not now. You cannot go with me. Now listen. But Thomas wanted to know the way. Thomas wanted to know the way. If there's any way possible for me to know how to go with you, Jesus, please reveal it to me because I don't want to be separated from you. Even if, now remember John 11, even if it means dying, I want to go, Jesus. What a beautiful response that the Lord Jesus gives. And man, you and I as Christians, we bank on this verse, John 14, 6. Jesus saith unto him, to Thomas, Thomas, I am the way. Thomas, you said, I want to know the way. Okay, Thomas, now listen to me. It may not make total sense to you yet, but Thomas, it will. Thomas, I am the way. Now, I want you to stop and think about this, folks. In these first two conversations, John 11 and John 14, do you get this sense that there is a heart of devotion to Jesus from this man? Do you get the sense that there is a great love for Jesus? Hey, Jesus, I, I'm, I'm willing to go with you, even to die with you at Bethany. And hey, Jesus, you said I, I, we can't go now, but Jesus, I, I, I want you to know how badly I want to go. And Jesus, I was willing back then, just a few weeks to go, to, to die with you here in Judea, and I'm willing to enter into death with you, to go with you. Just show me the way. I'm willing to do it. Folks, listen to me. There is a great devotion and a great love for Jesus from the heart of Thomas. And now I want you to notice the last conversation. And it's found after Jesus uh, death and I want you to notice this, and we'll be looking here in a moment at John chapter 20. 
But I want you to begin by looking at chapter 18, verse 1. Their time in the upper room has come to an end. Their conversation, that deep, loving conversation that Jesus has with his apostles has now come to an end. And when we come to John chapter 18, verse 1, it says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his, with his disciples over the brook Kidron, or what the Old Testament says, Kidron, where it was a garden into the which he entered and his disciples. And, of course, we know that was the Garden of Gethsemane. It's there in Gethsemane where Jesus prays. It's there in Gethsemane where the band of men was sent by the officers of the temple to arrest Jesus. It's there where Jesus was taken and then eventually led to the high priest. Now, before being taken to the high priest, Jesus said to the band of men here in chapter 8, and I want you to notice this, John chapter 18, verse 8. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these, meaning the eleven apostles, let these go their way. Now, I mention that because all eleven men, from Peter to Thaddeus, all eleven of these men had a choice. And just as they had feared to go to Bethany with Jesus in John chapter 11 because they knew that death would be the possibility at the hands of their countrymen. Now they find that actually coming to pass. The warning they had given to Jesus, they've sought to stone you, they're trying to kill you, you don't want to go there right now. I mean, you are just a red hot target for being put to death. You don't want to do this. And yet, Jesus went, and who was it that said, let us also go that we may die with him? Thomas, the one who gets the label of being the doubter. He said, Jesus, if you're going away, as you said in John 14, just show me the way because I, I'm willing to go with you even into death to be with you. But when those moments came, and this, what we would call a fearful event, came to pass, Jesus, in his kindness, and I, and I just pretty much find this amazing, he said to the band of men who had been sent, let these men go. Just let them go their way. But they had a choice. Every one of them could have said, no, we're not forsaking you. We're not leaving you. But we're told in the book of Matthew and in the book of Mark, these words were used by those two writers. They said, they forsook him. They had a choice. And they chose to forsake him. Now Thomas was part of that group. And Thomas, like his partner Matthew, and like Andrew, and like James, and like Thaddeus, and like Philip, all of those men forsook him at that moment. Now, I want you to think about this. They forsook him, and they were scattered abroad, really. They would eventually make their way back to the upper room. They would take solace and refuge in the upper room. But one of the men, I'm not talking about Judas Iscariot, but one of those 11 you would find missing from that upper room, at least part of the time, and that man was the Apostle Thomas. Now, I'm pointing this out for this reason. At this moment when they forsook him, there is going to be a lack of fellowship between these apostles. And at this point, because of what's going on, the fear that's swelling up in the hearts, it's like every man for yourself, and they all scatter. They all leave. This tells me something, how important it is, how important it is for brethren to be together. You know, in the book of Psalms, we're told how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity, but to dwell together. There are two very special passages. One is found in the Old Testament, the very last Old Testament book, the book of Malachi. And 
I've shared this a number of times. I hope over the years it's registered. I want to go back and read this to you. Malachi chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. It's talking about God's people, and it says, Ye have said, God's people have said, It is vain to serve God, and what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance, and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts, and now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and the book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. I point this out for this reason. In the midst of a time of great discouragement and heartache for God's people Israel, they came to the point where they said, you know what, serving God is useless. We look at these wicked people, man, they're set up for life, man. They got it easy, they got it good, they got money. You know, we're struggling, we are, we are suffering. You know, we've come back here thinking we rebuild the temple and rebuild the city and everything would be good and God's blessing would be upon us, but it seems almost like the opposite. Everything we thought was going to happen, what the prophets had told us seems to be opposite. And they were discouraged. They said, you know, all those people, they're so proud and arrogant, and they're happy. And we who are humbled before God are, are not happy. We're, we're miserable. And those wicked people, you know, everything's going their way. And those people who just tempt God, they never seem to get in trouble. They're always delivered from problems. And here we are trying to serve God, and we're going through problems. And you know what? When your mind goes that way, and let's be honest, and I'll be honest too, sometimes my mind goes there. Sometimes my mind goes there. It's real easy to say, I'm, I'm just, I'm not, I'm just going to stop. I'm going to stop reading my Bible, stop praying, stop going after God, because as these people said, it just seems vain. It's useless. What's the point? I don't seem to get the blessings that I thought I would get by living for God. But then you have verse 16, which is like a jewel. It says, they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. In other words, those believers, though in the midst of heartache and discouragement, kept each other, in a sense, accountable and encouraged to go on and not to forsake God and not to give up on God. And that's why, you know, a number of years ago, about three or four years ago, our theme, I can't remember it was 2017, 2016, we had the theme, one another. And there are several statements in the New Testament. The one another statements. Love one another. Pray one for another. Provoke one another. Care one for another. Serve one another. Exhort one another. Have compassion one of another. Fellowship one with the other. Be kind one to another. Over and over again, the attitude is maintain fellowship because we all have a tendency to get discouraged and get down and through that when we're by ourselves we can easily fall but through the encouragement of brethren we maintain a walk with God because I can be there and you can be there to say hey don't give up on God and when I get down somebody can say hey don't get, get down on God. Don't give up. You keep going. We'll make it through. And you know what? Sometimes it's just mere words. I remember several years ago, uh, you know, I've said this over and over again. Years ago when, when my son Chris was near, near death and uh, God sent one of our members, Grant Smith, down to Atlanta. And he just sat in that little garden behind Eggleston Hospital there at Emory University. And just, I, I don't remember the exact words, but it was just like God used Grant at that moment to kind of just push me back from that edge and keep me from just giving up. I mean, I'll never forget that moment. It, it's a special moment that I'll always cherish and I'll always remember how the Holy Spirit worked through him to just, through that gentle moment of fellowship, just to keep me from going over the edge. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, it says, Let us hold 
fast the profession of our faith without wavering. We waver because we get discouraged. We waver because we fear. We waver because of things that negatively occur in our lives. For he is faithful, that promised. I mean, God is going to fulfill what he said. It may seem at times like he's not going to do that, but he will. Verse 24, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. You know, this is kind of strange to speak of this because over these last several Sundays, because of what has happened here with the virus and so many of our people getting sick, we've not met physically together in this building. I hate it. I really do. Uh, to me, the worst thing that could happen is not to be together, not to be here together. And yet these things have befallen us. But I'll tell you one thing, it sure makes me have a greater appreciation of being together with my church family. It gives me a greater love for my church family. And I look forward to being back together with my church family. You say, okay, Pastor, what, why did you bring all this out? Because at this moment, Thomas may very well have been alone. Later in chapter 20, it references the fact that Thomas was not in the upper room with the other ten apostles. It may have been that Thomas, being separated from his brethren, sank deeper and deeper into this, what we call, and what Jesus referred to as his doubt. You know what? When there's no one there to help pick you up and to encourage you, it's easy to fall into that mindset. So quite possibly, this man we hear called Doubting Thomas took courage in and was fortified in the faith by his brethren that one of the reasons he remained faithful and, and deepened his love for Jesus Christ was during those three and a half years, he was fortified by the other apostles and the other apostles were fortified by each other. But at this moment, they'd all forsaken Christ. At this moment, they were all afraid. At this moment, they all fled. And let's be honest, we call Thomas doubting Thomas. And there are people who, in their theological mindsets, look at him in a, with a critical eye. And listen, I'm not trying to justify Thomas's doubt. But can we be honest? All of these apostles doubted. In Mark chapter 16, Bible makes it very plain. It wasn't just Thomas who doubted. Let me read to you from Matthew chapter, or Mark chapter 16. And here you find these words of the doubt that filled all 11 of these men. It says in verse 14 of Mark 16, Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. All of them doubted, not just Thomas. Thomas doubted no more than the others. His doubting response, though, might have actually revealed more than doubt, so to speak, but to me, it shows, if you would, a devotion. And by that I mean, for someone who said, I I'm willing to go with you into death, I, I want to be with you no matter what, to me, Thomas was so stung by the loss of the one that he was originally willing to die with, that it just devastated him at the moment. Now, think about this, and this is the reason I say that. He was willing to go with Jesus into death, but Jesus said, this death none of you can accompany with. This is something I have to do alone. You can't come with me. You can't go where I'm going. This death, I die alone. Of course, we know that. We know that only Jesus Christ could die for the sins of the world. Thomas could not be with him. And because he could not be with him, I think Thomas just felt this devastation, this loneliness. 
And here in chapter 20, as we come to a close tonight, I want you to look at verses 24 through 29. Chapter 20, beginning in verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see his hands, see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now notice those words. I will not believe. I mean, this man is crushed. He's been devastated. And because he has, was alone, I think those feelings just overwhelmed him. Verse 26, And after eight days, again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst of, and said, Peace be unto you. Now he's going to turn his focus on one man, on Thomas. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Thomas, listen, don't be faithless, just believe. Get back to believing me, Thomas. Now, I don't find that as a, a demeaning, demoralizing rebuke. I don't find that at all. I find those really words of a gentle rebuke, yes, but words of compassion, words of kindness, words of love. Thomas, I want you to believe me. You've been through a devastating experience. Thomas, believe me. Believe me. Walk with me in fellowship once again. And you notice what Thomas did? Listen, he didn't have to sit there and debate with the Lord. In fact, by the evidence of chapter 20, he did not even have to physically do what Jesus gave him permission to do, to take his fingers and thrust it into the nail prints of his hands, or to take his hand and thrust it into the wound in his side. He just simply, notice this, verse 8, 28, Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God, total surrender, total reestablishment of his trust and love and devotion for the Lord Jesus. And then Jesus made this really wonderful statement, verse 29, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet believed. And that's, that's concerning you. You are the one that has not seen and yet believed. You've never seen Jesus. You weren't there for the resurrection. You weren't there in the upper room when he appeared to those men. You weren't there along the shore when he fixed breakfast and challenged them to believe him and go into the world and preach the gospel. You weren't there at his ascension, but yet you've believed. I look at this man and don't find in him an attitude in which I can rightly criticize him as though he was a negative, unbelieving man. I, not at all. In fact, I find a man who had such a rich and deep devotion and love for Jesus Christ that when that moment came where he could not really accompany him to death, where Jesus said, you cannot come with me, that it just threw him, at least temporarily, for a loop. And, and quite honestly, I have found myself in that place plenty of times, and I found the same experience that Thomas felt. Just a love and a kindness and a sweetness and a drawing back into fellowship from my Savior. You know, even when he has to chasten us, he says he does it with an attitude of love. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. I think we need to change our attitudes toward Thomas and see him as a devoted man, a man with a deep love for Christ, a man who was devastated when he could not accompany Jesus to death and thought, you know what? That relationship is gone. 
And when he came to that point of having to confront his doubt, Jesus didn't tear into him and bemean him and belittle him. He just gently drew him back to himself. And I praise the Lord Jesus every time he does the same with me. You know what? Sometimes we are like Thomas in that we get very discouraged. Sometimes if we're in a position without the fellowship of the brethren, sometimes we end up in that great discouragement. Aren't you glad you have a friend named Jesus Christ who gently draws you back to himself? Doesn't always beat you up, just loves you back to himself. May we be like Thomas and just have a great devotion toward him and a great love for him. And whenever he speaks to our hearts, that we draw back into fellowship immediately and we recognize Jesus for who he is, our Lord and our God. Our Lord and our God. Well, I, hope, I hope it's been an encouragement to you tonight. I hope it's been a blessing to you as well. We'll go ahead and close in a word of prayer. So we'll bow together. Father, I thank you for the life of Thomas. I thank you, Lord, for allowing me to learn through it and encouraging me through it. I hope tonight that there is someone who has been encouraged, maybe someone who's been going through great doubt, someone who's been going through great discouragement and can take solace how you interacted and just ministered to Thomas during that, that dark moment in his life. Lord, we'll thank you for it. Again, I just want to say thank you that you have done a special work for the people of grace, those many folks who have been infected and now have experienced healing or are on that path to healing, and those who are in the hospital now home, thank you. We look forward to being back in your house. I know not everyone will be able to be back yet, but we thank you that we'll be able as a church family to come back and be together again. We praise your name for it. I pray just bless our folks. Uh, hedge them in throughout the rest of the week. Lord, help us to look for opportunities to tell others of Jesus. We'll thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, you folks have a good night, and look forward to seeing you Sunday morning, 930 or 11. Good night.